So you say you're, you know, you mentioned recovery. Yeah. Um, what what was that from, if you don't mind me asking? From addiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it was alcohol at first. It was alcohol, but then it went on to other things. Yeah. And um, yeah, it went on to other things. And basically, the social workers said, "Oh, like, if you don't go into rehab, we're going to take your kids." And I had three at the time. They were nine, seven, and eight. And I was angry at the fact that this social worker who didn't have any kids was telling me how to bring up my kids first of all. And then I was angry at the fact that I had kids because I thought if I didn't have kids then no one would care and I'm just another statistic and brrrr, that's the way my head works. And that's, I'm just 100 miles an hour and that's why I was shutting it down with all this stuff. And I remember they thought I had bipolar and they didn't know if the bipolar was, if, they, if I was self-medicating the bipolar with the alcohol and the drugs or if the alcohol and drugs were mimicking the symptoms of um, the bipolar. So I remember they gave me these pills to take and they made me put weight on and I thought, I'm not taking these, I'd rather be thin and mad than fat and sane. Stop taking these pills, start running around the common. And um, yeah, it's just been like, I remember waking up in A&E and having resentments with the paramedics because I had this wicked, this wicked Ghostbusters hoodie, like, and it had a zip but they decided to cut it into an S. I'm thinking, like, I know they were trying to save my life as well, but you cut it into an S when there was a zip. Like, I can't even get that back now. <laughs> even my Batman T-shirt, cut that. That's like, so, but yeah, so, and that's all. It's, the thing is, I was blaming everyone else, blaming social services, blaming, but it wasn't them, it was me. What, what this recovery stuff shows me is that I've got, to, like they say, if you've got, if you're pointing a finger at someone else, there's three pointing back, back at you and, um, if you take the me out of blame, it's just blah, blah, blah. So I've just got to stop blaming other people and being accountable for my own actions and realising um, that there's a way out. And thankfully, and the thing is, like I said, I found this stuff 20 years ago. I went into rehab the first time and it, it, um, it took a few goes because I just was in denial and that's not just a river in Egypt. But um, thankfully, I think I should be 20 years, but I'm actually 10. And I'm really grateful for that 10. I'm grateful I'm in double digits now. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how clean or whatever you are. You, it, it, if, if I don't do certain things, the old thinking can come in and then I'm back to where I was. And yeah, it's just, um, yeah. So life is much nicer this way. And I'm going to just keep putting one foot in front of the other for whatever, backward, never. Yes. That's good. That's a good way to look at it. Definitely. Yeah. With the alcoholism, do you feel like it leads to other things? Yeah, a, a definitely. Lot, lot definitely. Definitely, definitely. All kinds of... And they say, they were saying in rehab that if you're allergic to one drug, you're allergic to them all. And there was some woman in there, she used to say, oh, we... we there's like a 12-step recovery programme. And she used to say, oh, we come for our drinking, we stay for our thinking. Look back, but don't stare. If you don't change, you're going to remain the same person that needed to drink. We suffer from alcoholism, not alcoholism. The alcohol is in the bottle, the ism is in us. One day you'll find a peace that passes all understanding. Think, think, think. And that was always upside down, which made me think. Um, you can have alcohol in one hand and the rest of your life in the other, but you can't have both. And for so long, I tried to marry the two and it was everything else. It was never the alcohol. And they used to have these acronyms like HALT, Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired. So if you're ever vibrating on one of those, you could be in relapse mode or slip when sobriety loses its priority or making sure you put your recovery first. Anything people put in front of your recovery, you lose and make sure you get to at least three meetings a week. And I'm thinking, why do we have to do three? I want to do one. I'm going to do the Friday night one. That's my favourite one. But you had to do three, otherwise you'd get put on contract and get kicked out. So all these things they put in place, and it is a 12-step programme, but I live by two rules today. Rule number one, don't pick up no matter what. And rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And I've got to keep it that simple. Just don't pick up. No matter what happens, no matter what doesn't happen, a drink or a drug is not going to make it any better. It's just going to make it worse because you're going to have to relapse plus all the carnage that comes with that. So, yeah. All right. What, what does it mean when you say put on contract? Like a contract, so they will kick you out if you don't do what they say. Like you have to be put on, um, you have to do certain things. You're not allowed any alcohol and drugs on the premises. You're not allowed to, um, you have to go to a certain amount of meetings a week. They suggest doing 90 and 90, which is like doing a meeting a day, really. Um, but at least three. One for yourself, one for the newcomer, one just in case. And sometimes as well, they say, oh, the newcomer's the most important person in the meeting. So it's like I used to keep, re keep relapsing so I could be the most important person. But I didn't think, I don't think that's what they meant. They did not mean that. And they got these acronyms like ego, easing God out, or, or um, yet you're eligible to. So no matter, or complacency, when you get complacent, complace your ass on the seat. So just don't get complacent, resentful, don't get resentful because it's resentments that will make you drink because of something that's going on outside you. And it, it's all about feelings. You're drinking and using on feelings outside of your control. So in the end, it's all about 
love, tolerance and acceptance of people, places and things as they are. And once you can get that acceptance, then you're not really too bothered about what other people are doing. You've just got to just focus on yourself and what you can control. Yes. So. Okay, right. Enough yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> Boring you with recovery talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, you went to rehab. Was that for the alcohol? Was that for, yeah, for something? Yeah. So it was, okay, for, right. it was an alcohol rehab. So um, I went there, I think, I went like every five years. I went in 2003, 2000. Eight, and then the last time I went was in 2013, and there was another couple in between that. But the last time I went, I went in as a resident, but I didn't want to do that first, because I felt like, oh, I'm going to go in and do this, this six-month stretch, and then come out and think where's the nearest off-license. With the, um, it wasn't even a, like, I was thinking, oh, six-month stretch. There were no locks on the doors. You could leave at any time, but I just, it's just, I had to just change the way I thought about certain things. So it's all to do with my thinking, and then once I, um, yeah, thinking and behaviours, so... Once I, got, once I went in there, I sort of like learned a new way to manage my life without doing this stuff. Like now I can handle the stuff that I used to drink on. If I had a broken toenail, I'd drink. Or if it was raining, I'd drink. Or if it was sunny, I'd drink. Or if somebody pissed me off, I'd drink. So, yeah. Thankfully, I don't have to go back to that today. No, that's good. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, when did the alcoholism kind of start to change into to other things? Um, probably in 1990. Probably five, ninety-five, probably ninety-six actually. Okay. And yeah. how, how old were you then? Oh god, about twenty-one, something like that. Yeah, about twenty-one. Okay. Yeah, I've met some. I split up with the older three dad because I've got two baby father, <laughs> <laughs> three for one and two for the other. And um, yeah, I met this guy who introduced me to crack. And uh, I was like, hi, Liz Hatch. Hi, Matt. Hi, Crack. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I sort of got into that, which wasn't great at all. Yeah. It wasn't a great place to be. Um, yeah. yeah. But how do you feel when you're, when you're on Crack? I felt very stimulated. Yeah. The thing is, like, people see me now and they think, God, I'd hate to be with you when you were on that because you're very intense. So, yeah, you just don't really want to be around anyone when you're on that stuff. Like, it was like really that and alcohol. And then other things, it's like whatever it was, I just wanted more of it. That's the thing, I just didn't have enough. And, and the thing is, it's like I was always trying to stop, but um, I just couldn't stay stopped. There was always something that would make me go back on it. But with this program of recovery, program of action, you, it kind of helps you stay stopped. So now I'm like 3,672 days, which I'm not counting, I've got an app that does me that. So yeah, so 